this very special look at the history of food in the U.S. military. And if there's one cliché which absolutely applies here, it's that it's come a very long way. From hardtack to salted meat, sea rations to the MRE, U.S. military grub has improved dramatically from the colonial militia to present day. I briefly served from the mid to late 2000s and sampled various MREs, and based on my research into the diet of the average soldier of the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries, I had it pretty good. Militaries have been eating field rations for almost as long as men have slaughtered each other over petty squabbles. When Grog the Mighty left his cave to club his enemies to death, his wife packed him a gourmet selection of stones with ketchup and takis to wash it all down. But of course, in the interest of brevity, I'll be restricting this to the U.S. military, from the colonial militia through the global war on terror. In 1775, the Continental Congress issued a decree that daily rations for each soldier include one pound of beef, three quarters of a pound of pork, or one pound saltfish per day, one pound of bread or flour per day, three pints of peas or beans per week, or vegetables equivalent, and various other barely edible line items. But in what will become a theme for not just this feature, but the vast majority of U.S. military history, no plan, be it battle strategy or fine cuisine, survived contact with the enemy. The Continental Army struggled to provide even half the daily required rations, and soldiers often subsisted on salted pork and hardtack, a simple bread-like product made of water, flour, and sometimes salt. One soldier's account stated daily rations were mostly corned beef and hard bread, which could be hard enough to break the teeth of a rat. The biscuits were often so hard that soldiers had to soak it in water or coffee just so it'd be somewhat palatable. And because food was so scarce, commanders usually turned a blind eye when soldiers liberated supplies from local settlements. And because vegetables were so hard to come by, soldiers were issued vinegar to ward off scurvy. And it sometimes helped. Of course, the British had it even worse, with over 3,000 miles of Atlantic Ocean and one of history's most dramatic examples of an overextended supply line. And that factor alone figured heavily into the colonial victory. Can't win a war of attrition if it takes on average six weeks for basic necessities to reach the front lines. The War of 1812 was one of the lesser wars in U.S. history, and especially compared to the War for Independence, it was a short one, and also completely unnecessary, so I won't dwell on it too much except for two specific food-based innovations. Between the American Revolution and the War of 1812, the U.S. established a commissary-like system to purchase food and distribute it, but the version we're familiar with today, where it acts as a supermarket for the troops, didn't happen until the early 20th century. And the other major innovation was portable soup, which actually came about in the mid-18th century, but was widely exhibited by both armies during the War of 1812. According to HistoryCollection.com, portable soup was made by reducing broth after degreasing it, since otherwise the fat would become rancid. Once all the liquid was gone, the residue was shaped into cakes, cut into cubes, and stored in glass jars or crocks, and it could then be reconstituted with water and meat and vegetables added. And while it doesn't sound like a gourmet meal, portable soup lasted a while, which was a major concern before refrigeration or freeze-dry technology, or even the widespread use of tin cans, though the British did use them sparingly in the War of 1812. By the time war broke out between the Union and the Confederacy in 1861, canned food was a lot more common, but the predominant protein was still salted meats. And another holdover from the American Revolution was good old hardtack, which soldiers described as tooth dollars, sheet iron crackers, and worm castles. And that last one wasn't a coincidence, since the Army Biscuit, which some say was left over from the Mexican-American War 13 years earlier, often contained worms or weevils. And even if it didn't have any little stowaways, hardtack was barely edible, so soldiers preferred to toast it over a fire, crumble it into soup, or fry it up with pork and bacon fat in a dish the troops affectionately called Skilly Galley. Coffee was a staple, and rice, peas, beans, dried fruit, potatoes, molasses, vinegar, and salt were also available, and in rare cases, troops enjoyed fresh beef. 
At the outbreak of hostilities, the typical daily ration for both Yankees and Confederates was about a pound of meat and a pound of bread or flour, though keep in mind the bread was usually hardtack and the meat was usually salted pork. And for the latter, we're not talking about a savory bag of Jack Link's jerky or anything remotely similar. No, according to CivilWarAcademy.com, the most commonly issued salt pork was a stinky kind of blue, extra salty meat with hair, skin, dirt, and other junk left on it. And just like the hardtack, the salted pork had to be boiled or otherwise treated to make it somewhat palatable. And just how tasty was the daily rations? Well, these soldiers' expressions kind of say it all. But at least the Union had food. While the rations might have been just barely edible, and they did little to stave off scurvy, the Yankees had a steady supply of it throughout the war. The Confederates, though, were playing catch-up almost from the beginning. Now, you might be asking yourself, how is the premier agricultural region hurting for food? Well, prior to the war, the Mississippi River system made it so that it was cheaper and more efficient for southern plantation owners to purchase food than grow it themselves. Once the war started, the Union blockade cut off coffee, flour, and other goods from reaching the South. And with no flour, the South had cornbread instead of hardtack, so that wasn't so bad. But they also lacked many basic necessities. So they made do with what they had. In a letter to his wife, Greenberry Samuels of the 10th Virginia Infantry said, I now really enjoy a meal that two short years ago I would have turned away from with loathing. We poor soldiers have experienced the truth of the old Latin saying that hunger is the best sauce. And the Union's scorched earth policy made a bad situation desperate. In the 1864 Shenandoah Valley Campaign, the North destroyed all the crops, barns, and mills they came across, and General Sherman's infamous March to the Sea destroyed 10,000 horses and mules, 13,000 cattle, a half a million tons of fodder, and 13 million tons of corn. And the cumulative effects of the North's blockade and their total war policy were devastating. By one estimate, when the South surrendered at Appomattox on April 9, 1865, the Army of Northern Virginia had 27,500 men, but only three days earlier they had more than five times that number. Some were casualties or on leave, but a huge percentage followed their stomachs and deserted out of hunger. It's no exaggeration to say that food may have decided the course of the Civil War. Fast forward 60 plus years, and when the U.S. entered World War I in 1917, they had absolutely no problem feeding their troops. In fact, at the outbreak of the war in Europe in 1914, the U.S. provided the Allied powers with an abundance of foodstuffs and supplies. All war is horrific, and life in the trenches was an unceasing nightmare, with damp conditions, rats, disease, and the constant specter of one's inevitable demise. And for the single year they were engaged, the U.S. lost a relatively high figure of 117,000 troops, which was nothing compared to the European powers, which lost an entire generation. But 100k plus is still pretty high for a conflict that's often overshadowed by the one that followed. That said, food wasn't amongst the Doughboy's voluminous concerns. For one, field bakeries signaled the final end of hardtack, the infamous army cracker that needs to be dunked in water or coffee lest it break a tooth. The daily rations of U.S. infantrymen, or doughboy, was about a pound of meat, usually bacon or fresh meat, 20 ounces of potatoes, and 18 ounces of bread, all told about 5,000 calories. While most of the Allies experienced shortages, American troops had access to luxuries like milk, butter, candy, and cigarettes. According to one source, Doughboys received about 20% more food than British or French troops, and dramatically more than the Germans. And just as a quick aside, the U.S. home front, in the midst of a propaganda campaign that encouraged conservation, bore witness to several trends that would swing back around over a century later, like growing your own vegetables and substituting pea protein for beef. Oh, and you remember that Freedom Fries episode during the War on Terror? In World War I, sauerkraut was renamed Liberty Cabbage. Between World War I and World War II, the American Army developed the somewhat infamous letter-based rations, which evolved from the trench and reserve rations, 
themselves a pragmatic response to the poison gas attacks of the Great War, which would spoil food prepared at field kitchens that were uncovered. In World War II, American GIs might have been issued C rations, K rations, D rations, or some combination. There were also A rations, which were prepared in dining halls or field kitchens, and B rations, which were similar but didn't require refrigeration. But the grunt on the front lines didn't always have access to kitchens, so I'll mainly be focusing on the pre-cooked field rations. The field ration type C was around in various forms from 1938 through WW2, Korea, and it finally retired in 1958 when it was replaced by the Meal Combat Individual, or MCI. Initially, the C ration consisted of one of three meat options, or M units. Meat and beans, meat and vegetable hash, or meat and vegetable stew. And a standard bread portion, or B unit, which amounted to 4.5 ounces of biscuits, 0.5 ounces of sugar, and 0.3 ounces of pure soluble coffee. A year later, the tin cans housing the units were reduced from 15 to 12 ounces, and over the next couple decades, the C ration was continually modified and tweaked. Now, the K ration was a smaller portion designed for paratroopers, who first tried it out in 1942, and other highly mobile units like tank crews and motorcycle carriers. Each K ration came with three individually labeled boxes, breakfast, dinner, and supper, and each box was a full meal consisting of two types of small biscuits and a can of meat along with a soluble beverage and some type of confection, usually candy or chocolate. The biggest criticism of the K ration was how much its designers underestimated the caloric needs of troops performing strenuous activities. So a final caloric count of about 2,830 calories was found to be insufficient especially since the food was mostly of a dried or condensed sort, so it didn't really leave troops feeling full. And the fourth letter in the alphabet was the emergency ration, which was a chocolate bar. When it was being developed in 1937, Captain Paul Logan of the U.S. Army Quartermaster General had four specific requirements for Hershey's, which was the obvious company tap for this. It had to weigh four ounces, be able to withstand high temperatures, be high in food energy value, and I'm not kidding when I say this, tastes just a little better than a boiled potato. A very interesting requirement for a chocolate bar. And the sea ration continued evolving after the defeat of the Axis powers and the end to the most destructive war in human history. Let me tell you about an ice cream cat, Fifi. The end of World War II ushered in a new type of war between differing ideologies, capitalism and communism, with a series of proxy wars that would define global politics for the next half century. The first of those proxy wars took place on the Korean Peninsula, with the North backed by the Soviet Union and Red China, and the South by the United States and the UN. And the ensuing conflict saw two additional evolutions of the C ration, C2 and C3. Foreshadowing the present day, C2 contained pre-cooked foods which could be eaten hot or cold, and while the C3 featured a ton of variety, it was also relatively heavy at 5 pounds 8.5 ounces. And it included three meat components of ten possible varieties, three standard bread components with everything from crackers and jams to cereal, along with a 12-ounce can of fruit, an accessory packet with things like a can opener and toilet paper, and a cigarette packet. Now, food quality is a bit subjective, just look at my rating system, but one source seemed especially pleased with the chow offer during the Korean War, and that was the Army's Quartermaster Corps. I came across a piece written by Lieutenant Colonel Coy W. Baldwin, the Quartermaster Commander in 1953, and while he acknowledged the supply troubles, poor roads, mountainous terrain, and a long supply line from the States, he also stated matter-of-factly that, quote, the meals served in Korea are better than any served before under battle conditions. And he may have been right. The days of boiling barely edible army crackers and scraping off excess salt from a form of meat that probably tasted like shoe leather were long since past. Fast forward about a decade, and the Cold War was hotter than ever. The world came the closest it ever had to nuclear annihilation with the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, and three years after that was the official start of the U.S. ground campaign in Vietnam. And the Second Indochina War, as it became known, was the era of the Meal Combat Individual, or MCI. Introduced in 1958, the MCI was supposed to be an improvement over the C ration, which was derided for its lack of variety, but ultimately was no real improvement, and troops continued to slur it with the moniker of its predecessor, 
an unofficial C5 ration, if you will. In fact, the MCI was very similar to the C ration with a modest menu expansion. Each MCI came in a cardboard carton with four cans. The first was one of 12 different meat units with everything from beef steak to spaghetti and meatballs, meatloaf, and chicken noodle soup. The bread unit featured three varieties plus a spread can. And I'm just gonna go out on a limb and say the one with four cookies and a packet of cocoa powder was probably the most popular. And finally, there was the dessert unit, which came in three types, fruit, cake, or curiously, bread. So the bread unit had an all cookie option and the dessert unit had a bread option. And not sweet bread or something like that, but white bread. The cartons weighed about 2.7 pounds and provided 1200 calories. And while the weight doesn't sound like much, when your average infantryman was carrying approximately 85 pounds, every ounce matters. Each MCI also included an accessory pack with salt, pepper, sugar, instant coffee, non-dairy creamer, candy-coated chewing gum, toilet paper, a four-pack of cigarettes, and a book of 20 moisture-proof matches. Overall, troops enjoyed the MCI about as much as the sea ration, and for some of the more unpalatable content, they found additional utility, like the peanut butter, which made a fine fuel source to heat water for coffee. And speaking of fuel sources, the follow-up to the MCI included a flameless ration heater where water would create an exothermic reaction and heat the food. That follow-up, of course, is the MRE, or Meal Ready to Eat, which was approved in 1975 and tested in 1981, but up until 1983, troops in the field were still eating MCIs. The requirements for MRE said they had to be able to withstand parachute drops from 1,250 feet, non-parachute drops of 98 feet, and the packaging had to maintain a minimum shelf life of three and a half years at 81 degrees Fahrenheit. Initially, the MREs were limited to 12 varieties, and feedback wasn't overwhelmingly positive, but it was a lot lighter than its predecessor and tastier. And like I said, I did serve briefly for about four to five years, mostly in the reserves, but I realized early on in my research that I really needed to talk to someone with a much wider breadth of military experience, including dealing with, objectively speaking, the greatest field ration in US military history. So I got in touch with a friend of mine who served for 20 years in the Army in a variety of different roles, and I'll let him introduce himself. Sergeant First Class Ryan Phillips, I served from 22 February 1995 until 31 July 2016. Sergeant Phillips was actually introduced to the MRE back in high school ROTC, and he seemingly had a positive impression of them from the beginning. As a kid who was, you know, a teenager who was somewhat enamored by the military, I, you know, was always looking for the, for the MREs to eat them. And what your audience may not know is MRE stands for Meal Ready to Eat in the kind of formal parlance that the, the military likes to look, label things. So I had had M MREs long time before I went to basic training. Now, one of the most enduring traits of infantrymen is their ingenuity, their ability to Frankenstein and cobble together unique solutions to complex challenges, even challenges that no one was aware of. Earlier on, I mentioned how troops repurpose the peanut butter and MCIs as a fuel source to heat up coffee. And MREs aren't all that different, even if the food itself is a huge improvement over its predecessor. So actually, I was never a big fan of heating up MREs. I could probably count on one hand how many times I've actually heated the meal in an MRE. But I used the, the heaters all the time to heat up water for coffee. So what you would do is you would just get anybody's uh, heaters that they weren't going to use, and you'd save them up because it takes two heaters to heat up some coffee water. And so you would uh, take the bag of one and turn it inside out, and you'd put that inside the heater that's also a bag, and you'd fill the inside layer with water, and you put a little bit of water on the outside layer, and it would heat up, and it would heat your water, and you could make your instant coffee. As far as MRE variety, your main course in 1983 could vary from a pork patty to a ham and chicken loaf, beef stew, frankfurters, and several others. And as you'd imagine, something that's been in service as long as the MRE is changed pretty dramatically over the last four decades, with one of the most consistent favorites being macaroni and chili, or just chili mac. Of course, the only thing infantrymen do better than improvisation is complain. 
No one belly aches with more skill and gusto than U.S. military, so naturally troops came up with some creative criticisms of the MRE. Troops dubbed them meals rarely edible and three lies for the price of one. It's not a meal, it's not ready, and you can't eat it. They, they kind of had a reputation of being awful, um, and I didn't find that to be the case. Matter of fact, there was an old uh, running joke that MRE stood for meals rejected by Ethiopians, which is horribly on PC these days, but back then it was, nobody thought much, above, much about it. But I, I thought they were pretty decent, most of them. Um, but I tended to like the ones that other people thought were gross. The, uh, the omelet with ham, everybody hated that one, but I thought it tasted like you know, sausages. I loved it. There was also one that uh, was called the Beef Frankfurters, and it was just four uh, bunless hot dogs in a package. You know, the nickname they got was the Four Fingers of Death. And I'm pretty sure you could go and ask any Army vet that was in back then, and you mentioned the Four Fingers of Death, and they'll know exactly what you were talking about. In addition, MREs had very little dietary fiber, earning them the nickname Meals Requiring Enemas. Comedian Al Franken, who was on his eighth USO tour at the time, once joked the troops in Iraq that he'd had his fifth MRE so far, and none of them had an exit strategy. That said, troops in a war zone don't have MREs nearly as often as you might think. My time in Afghanistan, we, uh, we ate either in the chow hall on the uh, fobs or we ate local food when we were out on patrol. So I, I think I probably did not eat a single MRE in Afghanistan. Though that hasn't stopped the MRE from continuously evolving and improving. In 2018, the military introduced a pepperoni pizza MRE, which proved especially difficult to develop. Make the crust too dry and it ends up like hardtack, which was developed long before refrigeration or vacuum seal technology. If the crust was too moist, it would turn to mush in the packet. And the cheese, sauce, and pepperoni introduced additional problems. Ultimately, the military's food scientists got the ingredients to the same level of moisture and the same pH, which kept them from spoiling. And so we've gone all the way from a barely edible army cracker that had to be soaked in liquid to a slice of pizza capable of surviving in its package for three and a half years. Thanks for joining me for this special look at the history of food in the U.S. military. As always, be sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel, and I'll see you next time.